Hello. Hi, Bonte. What's up, me, Bonte? So today. I wanted to do the way to the imperturbable. Sutta number 106 in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is a sutta that I haven't done for quite a few years, so it's gonna be kind of new to me as we, as we go along too. Thus, if I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Kuru country at the town of the Kurus named Kama Sadama. And what that means is happy karma. There the Blessed One addressed the monks thus. Monks, Venerable Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. Monks, sensual pleasures are impermanent, hollow, false, deceptive. They are illusory, the prattle of fools. Sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perceptions in lives to come. Both alike are Mara's realm, Mara's domain, Mara's bait, Mara's hunting, gro hunting ground. On account of them, these evil, unwholesome mental states such as covetousness, ill will, and presumptive presumption arise. And they constitute an obstruction to the noble disciple in training here. Therein, a noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come constitute an obstruction to the noble and noble disciple in training here suppose i were to abide, abide with a mind abundant exalted having transcended the world and made a firm determination with that mind. When I do so, there will be no more evil, unwholesome states, such as covetousness, ill will, and presumption in me. And with the abandoning of them, my mind will be unlimited, immeasurable, and well-developed. What are we talking about here? We're talking about being in a jhana all the time, not just while you're sitting. Too many people have the idea that the only time that they do meditation is when they're sitting. And that is a wrong idea. It's real important for you to understand that this is not a sometime practice. This is an all the time practice. Don't let your mind get caught up in nonsense and hindrances. That means you're not in a jhana. But you can be in a jhana, and the best jhana to be in all the time is the fourth jhana. That is 
equanimity, balance of mind all the time. It takes practice and you have to be able to use the six R's all the time. Not just while you're sitting in meditation. Do you get hindrances when you're doing daily activities? Well, of course you do. Why? Because your mindfulness is not strong enough. Why do I want you to smile all the time? Because it brings up your mindfulness so that you're fully aware during your daily activities. So it's a real important thing that you practice staying with your jhana while you're walking, while you're doing things, while you're working, while you're cleaning, while you're doing everything. Keep reminding yourself with the six R's to come back to loving kindness and radiate that loving kindness. Okay. That way you won't have distracting thoughts. You won't have unwholesome thoughts and ideas popping into your mind. And it takes practice and it is it's slow progress. It's not going to be fast because I'm talking about a complete change in lifestyle. Now, when the Buddha was giving Dhamma talks, his mind was so incredible that he could make a determination to be in a jhana in between every word that he spoke. And he could be in any one of the jhanas. Now his mind didn't have hindrances arise. And that's one of the advantages of being an arahat. A while back on the internet, there was a big discussion about whether you had to disrobe to be an arahat. Well, to be quite honest, it wouldn't even come up in your mind to stay a, to be a layman. You you desire to stay in the wholesome state all the time, and you need the support of the Sangha to be able to do that. So it wouldn't even be a question if you were an Arahat, whether you're gonna stay as a layman or not. In the suttas, it says that you can stay a layman for seven days. And then your mind is going to get into the cessation of such of the cessation of perception feeling and consciousness and stay there and you will experience parinibbana but there were a lot of arahats during the time of the buddha and they were running around all over the place doing whatever good they could teaching people by example, as well as with words. And that's a blessing to be around someone that has an uplifted mind all the time, has an, a mindful awareness all the time. Okay. When I, when I transcend the world by keeping in a jhana, when I do so, there will be no more evil, unwholesome mental states 
such as covetous uh, ill will and presumption. That means thinking a lot, presuming that you know the truth instead of using your intuition all the time. And with the abandoning the, of them, my mind will be unlimited, immeasurable, and well-developed. So a well-developed mind is a mind that is in a jhana all the time. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind ac acquires confidence in this base. Once there is full confidence, he either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. Resolving upon it with wisdom means seeing the links of dependent origination and how they work all the time. On the dissolution of the body. After death, it is possible that this consciousness of him, his leading to rebirth may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable. Thus, monks, this monks is declared to be the first way directed to the imperturbable. The imperturbable mind is any one of the jhanas. Now, if you have to uh, if you want to, you can be in the first jhana all the time. But that's an imperturbable state if you develop it that way, if you use it that way. I used to have a student that he would come for a retreat and he would try real hard during the retreat and then the last day of the retreat, he would come to me and he said, now I can go back to being the way I was. Well, what's the point of doing the practice if you're just going to be doing a once in a while practice? Again, a noble disciple considers thus. There are sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perception in lives to come. Whatever material form there is, all material form is the four great elements and the material form derived from the four great elements. These four great elements are in everything. Some are strong, stronger for some things, rocks and that sort of thing. The earth element is quite a bit stronger than uh, the water element, but there's still some moisture in the rock. And there's still movement in the rock, although it's with the molecules and, and that sort of thing, that there is movement. And there is heat and cold. So those are the four great elements. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there's full confidence, he either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that this consciousness of him leading to rebirth may pass on to rebirth in the imperturbable. This monks is declared to be the second 
way directed to the imperturbable. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perception in lives to come. Material form here and now and material form in lives to come. Perception of forms here and now and perception of forms in lives to come. Both alike are imper uh, impermanent. What is impermanent is not worth delighting in, not worth welcoming, not worth holding to. And this brings me to another thing that it seems to be that people, when they're meditating, they misunderstand the second R of the six R's, and that is release. You don't note something until it goes away by itself. You don't just let it go and still hold on to it a little bit. Any holding on to a distraction is feeding that distraction. Oh, but it's a pain and it hurts so much. So, it's a pain, so what? Why do you make a big deal out of it? Why do you get caught up in it? Because I don't like it. I want it to stop. I want it, I want to control it and make this do the things I want it to do when I want it. So there's a, a real problem with the release step. The release step is Stop keeping your attention on the distraction. Don't pay attention to it anymore, even though it doesn't go away, so what? Don't keep your attention on it and relax. If you don't have the relaxed step in your practice, and practice the six R's often, you will not be able to attain Nibbana. It's just that simple. The relaxed step is how you let go of craving, how you let go of the false belief in a personal self how you get caught up in hindrances, how you cause yourself pain. And you cause yourself pain, just like you're your own teacher. You have to take full responsibility of causing the pain yourself of being sad, being depressed, being angry, being fearful, whatever the catch of the day happens to be, if you keep feeding that fear, that anxiety, that dislike, if you keep feeding it, you are going to cause yourself immeasurable, immeasurable amounts of suffering. And that's what you're doing to yourself. You can't blame somebody else for your suffering. A lot of people try. It's his fault. I didn't do it. Blame him. Blame her. They caused it. No, doesn't work, does it? 
Stop causing yourself suffering, please. And remember, the more you can stay in a jhana, the less you're going to have distractions. So it's a real important thing to consider. When you're walking down the street, what are you doing with your mind? When you're walking from one place to another, what are you doing with your mind? Ho hum. You just let your mind go, do whatever it wants to, and you get caught up in the nonsense of mind wandering around like it knew what it was doing. Stay in the jhana. Then you won't have that problem. It takes a lot of practice. You have to remember and re-remember often when your mind is distracted by something. But release it. Don't hold on to it. And relax. That's real important. Now the next part of the meditation is Bring up something wholesome. Smile. Lighten your mind. Don't allow your mind to get heavy. If you get serious about anything, what happens in your mind? Like a rock. Heavy. A lot of repeat thoughts if there's real attachment to it. And what good are repeat thoughts? Nobody's been able to explain that to me, that there's some good in having repeat thoughts. Just like they're on a tape deck. That means you're not using the relaxed step. And when you use the relaxed step, your mind becomes pure, clear, observant, mindful. So you need to remember to practice this continually, frequently. And when he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there's full confidence, he either attains to the imperturbable now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. The imperturbable now is equanimity. And when you get higher and higher in the jhanas, it's disenchantment. That is another form of equanimity. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that this consciousness of his leading to rebirth that means there's still some craving and clinging left in your mind, may pass on in the uh, imperturbable. This, monks, is declared to be the third way directed to the imperturbable. Now we're going to go to the base of nothingness. Again, monks, a noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. 
sensual perception here and now and sensual perception in lives to come. Material forms here and now and material form in lives to come. Perceptions of form here and now and perception of forms in lives to come. And perceptions of the imperturbable all are pre, <coughs> excuse me, all are perceptions. Where these perceptions cease without remainder, that is the peaceful, that is the sublime, namely the base of nothingness. The thing with getting into nothingness and keep practicing that is mind is not looking outside of itself anymore. You're in strictly a mental state. unless there is contact. Now, contact means uh, a fly lands on you or a bee or ants or whatever it happens to be that touches you. You will feel that, but it's not gonna make your mind shake and jumble. You just feel it, let it be. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there's full confidence, he either attains to the base of nothingness now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. When you get to the realm of nothingness, this is probably one of the most interesting states that you can be in, in meditation. And this is where you get to develop the amount of energy you put into staying with your object of meditation with balance. Now, the way that I teach, I teach the Brahma Viharas. So the realm of nothingness is, goes along with the state of equanimity, complete balance, no excitement. Seeing your favorite food does not make your mouth uh, drool a little bit. We have a dog here that if he sees food and we don't give it to him right away, he starts drooling all over everything. So you know he's not in a state of nothingness. <laughs> <laughs> On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that this consciousness of him leads to rebirth. Now, when you get into the realm of nothingness, the rebirth that you're going to experience is in a mental realm. And you're gonna be in that realm for a really long, 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 long period of time. It is a happy realm to be in it lasts for 60,000 mahakapas. That's how much good merit you make by staying in that realm. And a mahakapa is in earth years, it's 10 with 560 years, be, uh, 560 zeros behind the 10, that's one Mahakapa, and you got 60,000 of them. So you're not gonna come around for quite a while. It's not Nibbana, 
It is a mental realm. Now, I don't talk about this very often, but when I'm teaching you and getting into the realm of neither perception nor non-perception, if you never go any higher than that, if you don't attain Nibbana, when you die from this realm, you're going to be reborn in a Brahma Loka for 84,000 Mahakapas. So it's a real long time. And time is kind of a, an odd thing to measure with. Because different realms, like, uh, let's say, the uh, Tavza teams of heaven. One day in the Tavza teams of heaven is equal to a hundred years here. So time, it, it depends on what realm you're in and how long it lasts. You can't always equate it to earthbound years. Anyway, there are different ways to get to the realm of nothingness. Now, I've, I've told this in a lot of different discourses. I, I played with the realm of nothingness for quite a while. I was doing it for six months, and I was doing it not by sitting in meditation, although I did sit in meditation. I wasn't using that object of meditation. But I was continually asking myself when a thought came up, when a feeling came up, when a sensation came up, where did that come from? Is that me? Is that mine? Now in Sutta number 35, it's, there's a, a question of every one of the aggregates, the body, do you control what happens with the body? Can you make it be, is, can you say, let my body be such and such, let my body not be such and such? If we could do that, we would never have anything like a coronavirus. But we can't control that. It's not us. It is just a physical feeling, a mental feeling. It's not me, it's not mine. I have no control over uh, body, feeling, perception, formations, or consciousness. None of those is me. It's not myself. And that's what I was doing for about six months. I kept on looking at everything. When I could remember, everything that came up into my mind, I questioned whose it was and where it had come from. And I, I got to some very deep realizations of the realm of nothingness. It's quite an interesting period of time. This monks is declared to be the first way directed to the base of nothingness. 
Again, a noble disciple gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or an empty hut considers thus, this is void of a self or of what belongs to a self. <coughs> Excuse me. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there is full confidence, he either attains to the base of nothingness now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. Resolving on it with wisdom means taking a closer and closer look at how the links of dependent origination actually work. Pointing the quiet mind to seeing this process and seeing it in such a way that you see all of the Four Noble Truths in each link. It's not easy to do that. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that this consciousness of his, leading to rebirth, may pass on to rebirth in the base of nothingness. Like I said, that lasts for a really long time. but it is a pleasurable realm. There is no suffering in that. When you get to this degree of meditation, your mind is incredibly pure. Unless your mindfulness slips and you're not in that jhana anymore. And then you have to use the six R's to get back into the jhana. So it's a real important part of the practice to keep things going all the time. I just had some people here that um, they were in their 20s and they couldn't quite grasp the idea of staying in the jhana all the time. And they talked about uh, smoking pot, which really tears up your meditation. It, it just makes your mind wander all over the place. Doing alcohol, that dulls your mind something fierce. doing psilocybin, a hallucinogen, that causes your mind to be very active too. So what I'm, what I'm starting to observe in the younger generation that, that's in the teens and 20s, they're looking for something and they want to have it happen very fast. They don't want to work for it. They want to be able to attain Nibbana quickly. They want to be on the spiritual path without doing the work of getting there. And that's kind of sad, really. We're, our fast food society is such that we want to have food as fast as we can. So we don't even have to get out of the car. We can just go up and have them bring it to us, already prepared. They want, we want everything to be quick. One of the things that I noticed when I came back from being in Asia for 12 years well, there's a few things that I noticed. 
One is you can't be in a house in the West where it's absolutely quiet. You got refrigerator going, you have heaters and air conditioners going, you have all kinds of noises and those are distractions. When I was in Asia, I was in a, a quite often in huts that didn't have any electricity. And I had to use candles at night to read or just to have some light. And I come back and I can't, I can't find any place in the house that's quiet. It was kind of disturbing because I had 12 years of being in Asia. Another thing that I noticed is that the attention span of people in the West is about a minute and a half before they get distracted. They don't see their mind as being active. They don't see that this is nonsense thoughts that, that's running through that you react to all the time. Now, when your mindfulness is good, you respond with strong observation. But you don't act the way you always act when this kind of feeling arises. So that's another advantage of the mindfulness being strong. Now, another thing that, that I've seemed to notice quite a bit in the West is an awful lot of people, they have hard times that they go through and they hold grudges and they hold dislikes of this person or that person because of this or that. And about half of the people that I wind up teaching, I highly recommend that they start doing forgiveness meditation to let go of those past experiences that they're still holding on to, because that will stop their progress in being able to have a pure mind. How can you have a pure mind when part of your mind is like a rock and really is squeezing tight? I don't like, I don't want, I had so much pain when I was growing up because of this or that. So forgiveness meditation is starting to become really an important part of the practice. Now, I have been criticized because I use a commentary for the first part of the meditation that I teach. In the suttas, it never talks about sending loving kindness to individual people. But I found that the progress in meditation here in the West is much faster when we work with individuals. So it's a lot more useful than just going into the six directions to start with. And an awful lot of people wind up being happier all the time. Now, when you're walking down the street, what kind of jhana should you be in? Well, how about loving kindness? 
wishing everybody around you a smile, a happy, uplifted mind. But you have to have a happy, uplifted mind before you can give it away. Right? You can't give away something that you don't have. So practice that. And being kind to yourself. It's really important. Too many people are critical about themselves. And they wind up being attached and reacting to their own thoughts and feelings. And this causes a lot of suffering. So to let go of the suffering. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, I am not anything belonging to anyone anywhere, nor is there anything belonging to me in anyone anywhere. Strong statement. How much pain do we have because this is, you're my mate. You're hanging on. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there's full confidence, he either attains to the base of nothingness now or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. On the dissolution of the body after death, it is possible that this consciousness of his leading to rebirth may pass on to rebirth in the base of nothingness. Now, I keep saying this over and over again. If it's subject to rebirth, that means that they have not experienced Nibbana yet. The way that I teach, I very much prefer that you stay with the instructions the way I give them and experience Nibbana, and then you don't have so much problems with rebirth. This monks is declared to be the third way directed to the base of nothingness. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perceptions in lives to come. Material form here and now and material forms in lives to come. Perceptions of forms here and now and perceptions of form in lives to come. Perceptions of the imperturbable, perceptions of the base of nothingness, all are perceptions. Another word for perceptions is concepts. Okay. We only think in concepts. Now, you're looking at the computer here and now. What is a computer? Where is the computer? Is it the screen? Is it the typing pads? Is it the internal, different parts of the internal organs? Where is a con the uh, computer? Well, it's a lot of tiny little parts put together to make up the concept of computer. 
We only think in these terms. When you experience Nibbana, it is a state with no concepts. Think about that one. So that's what I, what I try to encourage all of my students to experience. To experience Nibbana. And then you get off the wheel of Zansara and you don't have to put up with this kind of nonsense anymore. Where these perceptions cease without remainder, that is the peaceful, that is the sublime, namely the base of neither perception nor non-perception. I, I have a lot of students when they come for the first time for a 10 day retreat a lot of the students have not done a whole lot of meditation. They've tried some. Some have done it for quite a few years too. I mean, there, there's always that. But uh, when you get to this state, which is beyond equanimity and the realm of nothingness, there is absolutely nothing that happens in your mind. It's just a dead blank space. And this is what I call the quiet mind. Now, you, I want you to use that as your object of meditation. And you... You stay with the quiet mind for as long as you can. This is where I start encouraging people to start sitting for longer and longer periods of time because you need the time to be able to observe how this process actually works. And when I say a longer period of time is three hours, four hours, sometimes more, depending. And the first time you get to three hours, you think, oh, I've never done this before. It's really something. And it is. It's a big achievement. But once you start having the confidence that you can sit that long, it becomes easier and easier and then it gets to three hours and you, you get up and you say, well, why did I break that sitting? It was good. So you start extending a little bit more. But always after sitting long periods of time, when you get up, you stay in the realm of nothingness with equanimity and go out and walk very quickly. And walk up and down hills, walk up and down stairs, however you want to do it, but walk fast enough that you actually are starting to breathe heavy. And that's quite important. Okay. When he practices in this way and frequently abides thus, his mind acquires confidence in this base. Once there's full confidence, he either attains to the base of neither perception nor non-perception now, or else he resolves upon it with wisdom. On the dissolution of body after death, it is possible that this consciousness of his leading to the rebirth may pass on to rebirth in the base of neither perception or non-perception. This, monks, is 
declared to be the way directed to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, here a monk is practicing thus, it might not be and it might not be mine. It will not be and it will not be mine. What exists, what has come to be, that I am abandoning. Thus he obtains equanimity. Venerable sir, does such a monk attain Nibbana? One monk here, Ananda, might attain Nibbana and another might not attain Nibbana. What is the cause and reason, venerable sir, why one monk here might attain Nibbana while another here might not attain Nibbana? Here, Ananda, a monk is practicing thus. It might not be and it might not be mine. It will not be and it will not be mine. What exists, what has come to be, that I am abandoning. Thus he obtains equanimity. He delights in that equanimity, welcomes it and remains holding to it. As he does so, his consciousness becomes dependent on it and clings to it. So that's why I have you keep going deeper and deeper into your practice so you don't cling to anything. So you start realizing that anything you get involved in, in a thought, in a feeling, in a sensation, in a memory, anything you get involved in, don't make it a big deal. Let it be by itself. Don't keep your attention on it. Relax. Because there's tension and tightness in your mind. And that is craving. Then smile. In other words, lighten your mind. The lighter your mind is, the better your mindfulness is. The better your mindfulness is, the faster your progress in meditation becomes. A monk Ananda who is affected by clinging does not attain Nibbana. But Venerable Sir, when that monk clings, does what does he cling to, to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. When that monk clings, venerable sir, it seems he clings to the highest and best object of clinging. When that monk clings, he clings to the best and object of clinging. Now, actually, uh, whenever I see the word clinging by itself, I generally put out craving and clinging. That monk is craving and clinging because he's attached to it. He, I want it. For this is the best object of craving and clinging, namely the base of neither perception nor non-perception. So if you have to be attached to something, be attached to that. Okay. <laughs> of course, I'm going to try to get you to stop being attached to it so you can go further. Here, Ananda, a monk is practicing thus. It might not be and it might not be mine. It will not be and it will not be mine. What exists, what has come to be, that I am abandoning. 
Thus he obtains equanimity. He does not delight in that equanimity, welcome it or remain holding to it. Since he does not do so, his consciousness does not become dependent on it and does not crave and cling to it. A monk, Ananda, who is without craving and clinging attains Nibbana. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy to understand. It is wonderful, venerable, sir, it is marvelous. The Blessed One indeed has explained to us the crossing of the flood in dependence on one support or another. But venerable sir, what is noble liberation? Here Ananda, noble disciple, considers thus. Sensual pleasures here and now and sensual pleasures in lives to come. Sensual perceptions here and now and sensual perception in lives to come. Material form here and now and material forms in lives to come. Perception of forms here and now and perception of forms in lives to come. Perceptions of the imperturbable. Perception of the base of nothingness and perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This is personality as far as personality extends. This is the deathless, namely the liberation of mind through not craving and clinging. Thus, Ananda, I have taught the way directed to the imperturbable. I have taught the way directed to the base of nothingness. I've taught the way directed to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. I have taught the crossing of the flood in dependence upon one support or another. I have taught noble liberation. What should be done for him, for his disciples out of compassion by a teacher who seeks their welfare and has compassion for them that I have done for you. There are these roots of trees, these empty huts. Meditate, Ananda, do not delay, or else you will regret it later. This is our instruction to you. That's what Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. That gives you a pretty in-depth of what you can expect once you start getting into jhana more regularly and staying in jhana for as long as you can. It doesn't matter whether you're walking or doing things, you can still be radiating loving kindness and stay in a jhana, making a determination that I want to be in the third jhana today, where there's equanimity, there's calmness of mind. So you can do that. Okay, now I've been talking for a long time, like always. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Good evening, Bhante. Good afternoon, Bhante. How are you? Hello? Oh, you're on the email. Do you hear me now? 
Yes, I do. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm excellent. Uh, Good. You, you keep talking about, uh, you know, if we follow what you say, we will experience Nibbana, and which I have several times. Yeah. What is, the, what is the difference between experiencing Nibbana and attaining Nibbana? Because same we just same. covered it in the sutta so many times today, attaining Nibbana. Same, same. It's not a state where you go and just stay in a state of Nibbana. If, if you experience Nibbana, you have attained it. Okay. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Scott. Hi, Bonte. <laughs> How's it? <laughs> it's it's a little still a little smoky here, so um, I would love to be in that uh, clear Missouri air right now. So everything is. Well, come, come and visit again. We got plenty of time. Thank you. I look forward to that. Uh, <laughs> by the way, that last question yeah. that uh, Sunil asked, I'm wondering if in that question he was also asking about um, Nirota, <coughs> the, you know, the cessation in relationship to Nibbana, and sometimes that's confusing. And uh, I know you've spoken on that several times, but it may be helpful for this, for uh, to elucidate his question. You have to be able to experience Niroda before you attain Nibbana. Okay, Niroda is the space where there is no perception, feeling, or consciousness. You have to be able to experience that, but you don't know you're in that state until you come out. When you come out, depending on your how sharp your mindfulness is, you will see very quick, tiny, little links of dependent origination. That is the experience of Nibbana. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Scott, because I understood it, it better now that if it, it means being able to stay in Nirodha means you can stay in, you can be more in Nibbana. Not really. The experience of Nibbana happens and then when you come back out, you have attained that experience, but it is not a continuous experience. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. Okay. So, Bhante, uh, that... <clears throat> That would then uh, indicate that uh, one would uh, have the ability to experience Nibbana, such as path um, maga or right. tuition pala, only a certain number of times, but would be able to experience Niroda in almost a, you know, repetitiously. Well, at any at any point. Once you get to Anagami, you can experience Niroda any number of times you want to. Right? All you have to do is start developing your uh, mind to be more pure so that you don't have any lust or hatred arising in it anymore. And then all you have to do is start practicing, making a determination of going in and out of Niroda whenever you want to. Just like with your daily activities, you can go in and out of a jhana whenever you want to. 
You want to be able to develop that ability. That's why an awful lot of people in the West, they have the wrong impression that the only time you do meditation is when, when you sit every day or you go and do a retreat. The rest of the time you're going to just kind of slack off and don't do anything. And what you have to do is remember that this is an all the time practice. And when you gain confidence in being able to do that, that changes the personality a lot. So you have more equanimity in your mind all the time, no matter what happens or what someone says. Karen, you, you had a question? Uh, yes, Bandit. Okay. So I just wanted to ask, um, so in the, you know, the beings uh, who are born in the realm of nothingness, how do they proceed towards Nibbana? Well, I have a lot of students that get into the realm of Nibbana. They, they continue practicing and continue using the six R's. The, the beauty of this practice is that it is a natural unfolding of things as they arise. So when you continue on and you keep going deeper, then you will be able to go beyond the realm of nothingness to the realm of neither perception nor non-perception. And when you go beyond that, that is a cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, and you will experience Nibbana at that time. Okay? I can't hear. I have a question. Okay. Bandi, I have a, a question. Uh, oh. Are you able to hear me, yes. Helen? I hear you. Do okay, you hear Bhante, I'm I'm a new I'm a new like uh, uh, a student for like uh, meditation. I mean, uh, a sitting meditation, especially which I have like just uh, started like uh, uh, a, a year or two ago, but couldn't get anything out of it until this um, uh, COVID. That a few months ago, I had a, a session of uh, a foundation of mindfulness uh, from another like uh, monastery that I started to understand a little bit more. And from your thoughts, I lately was uh, uh, like benefiting uh, from the six hours. And I have a question about like the um, the breathing uh, meditation. And the six hour uh, uh, process, uh, is it like a, a, a training of like uh, the base of redirecting our, our neural path? And I find the six hour is uh, helping me to, uh, to understand more instead of just more than uh, the breathing. The breathing is the base of retraining our consciousness. Is that my question is that, is that a base to train our our, our conscious to notice the, uh, the unconscious movements of our body at the start. And the six hour is taking us to an advanced level of like, uh, not just breathing, but any perceptive like uh, things com coming on with our senses. So it's not limited to sitting, that it can be also like on a daily activity basis. Is that what it is? The right. understanding, is it correct first? I want to yes. understand. Yes, the, the, your understanding is good. The thing that okay. most people do when they're doing the breathing meditation is they make the breath the focus of their meditation. Yes. And according to the instructions that the Buddha gave, you're using the breath as the reminder 
to use the six arts. Because on the in-breath, you have to tranquilize your bodily formation. And later on, it says in the Anapanasati Sutta, uh, you, on, on the in-breath, you have to tranquilize your mental formation. So it's the okay. reminder uh, to relax on the in-breath and relax on the out-breath. Don't over focus on the breath. Now, when I when I teach people mindfulness of breathing, I teach them that they have to smile while they're doing that too. Because if you just use your breath as your object of meditation, you have a tendency to get very serious and over focus on the breath. You make it a big deal. And that takes away from your actual object of meditation. Okay. Okay. The actual object of meditation is the movement of the mind. Is that what it is? Watching, like how we react? How mind's attention moves, yes. Okay. Um I have a second uh, personal uh, experience, which I need to clarify. Okay. okay. After I started to use the six out, um, I find myself like uh, more delight, but I was looking at myself into a second Helen. Like I'm, I'm, I'm much happier to see there is this new like uh, identity of myself in front of me that I can talk to her. Is this safe or this is not? Because once I see what is what she's coming up, I, I'm very happy and smiling. I don't know why, but is this correct or not? Because it's been coming up and experiencing this, this second no. mind of like, it's working no. there. It's not a second <laughs> mind. Don't get caught. What is it? it? Don't get caught in talking to it. Okay. Stay with your object of meditation. And if your object of meditation is being with the six R's, stay with the six R's instead of getting caught up in the uh, verbalization of things. As you go through the jhanas, you have to let go of the verbalization completely as you start to get a little bit deeper. And this is real important that you don't get caught up in conversation with yourself because you'll drive yourself crazy. Literally, you can drive yourself crazy. Okay? Thank you. But, but be happy with that kind of feeling when it comes up. Smile into it's it. It's very happy. Like lately, I've been like I've been doing this, and I think it was like a little bit of like, uh, but it's not right. It shouldn't be okay. That's perfect. Continue on, please. <laughs> Thank you, Banti. Okay, I let the others do yeah okay. their questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, Banti, I have uh, three questions. Okay. Yeah, uh, my first question is uh, related to the first first question. Uh, it's kind of in neither perception nor nor, nor perception. Uh, are there still any perceptions exist or there are no perceptions at all? Well, just by the sheer definition, sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes, so can, sometimes mind gets so subtle that you can't recognize it with your perception. That is why when you get to this realm, you have to when you before you get out of the med of the sitting meditation and do some walking, reflect on what happened during that sitting. And some of those perceptions, they will still be in your memory and they will come up. When they come up, then you six are them and continue on. Okay. 
It's just that mind gets so incredibly subtle, you can't really recognize it as a perception. But there is perception there, because there is feeling there. Feeling and perception are always together, but it can be very subtle. Uh, adding to this one, can I say that uh, there is consciousness also exists, but it is very subtle. We yes. don't recognize the consciousness. Well, it, it's hard to recognize it as such. It is difficult. But it is not seized, right? It's not what? It, it is not stopped. It, means it doesn't seize it over there. No, it's there. Okay. Until you attain Nibbana. Okay. When you attain Nibbana, there's no feeling, perception, or consciousness that arises at that time. Okay. Uh, Bhante, I can jump into the, my next question. Okay. Um, like, you say that uh, when, when we are with economy, if there is very small movement, apply 6R and relax into it. Right. Uh, my understanding is that uh, when we do that, we don't create new cravings and clingings and the right. new chain doesn't, the, the chain doesn't go forward. True. And my question is, my question is, uh, when we do, when, whenever that movement comes, we, we relax, is it mean that we are still with the object of meditation or we, we no. are not? It means that your mindfulness had some kind of disturbance and it wasn't so sharp. And you weren't staying on your object of meditation as clearly as you can. So that's why you have to use the six R's. To get so you're not in the jhana when that is distracting you. You are in the jhana when you're back on your object of meditation. Okay, it's like for a short moment we came out and came in. Right. Okay. Uh, then last question is uh, it's not related to meditation. Okay. Like this was like uh, when I was practicing with other technique, there was over emphasis on developing 10 paramis. When I see those paramis individually, yeah, those looks good, but I never came across a sutta where, still now, where Buddha recommend to develop these paramis. Can you explain that? Well, developing the paramis means during your entire life not while you're sitting in meditation. Okay. One of the paramis is developing tranquility. One of them is developing your determination. One of them is being honest, being truthful. So this is something that's for the entire your entire life developing these wholesome habits. Okay. Okay. Is it, is it uh, mentioned anywhere in Sutta or is it coming from commentaries? As a meditation? Uh, the, the concept of Paramitas. Okay. That's in the Anguttara Nikaya. Okay. Okay, it talks about them pretty pretty well for a while. Okay. Uh, okay, Bhante, that's all. Uh, those three were my questions. I don't have other questions. Now, the, 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 they're called the perfections, the parami. There's three degrees of the parami. And to become a Sama Sambuddha, you have to go through all of them and perfect each one of these parami 
as high as you possibly can. Uh, just, uh, just want to add another question. Like, is it like, <laughs> uh, is it like developing parameters is applicable for uh, for those who are in the path of arahant as well, right? Sure. Yeah, it's just wholesome qualities. Okay. Okay, and the more you let go of craving, the more wholesome qualities you naturally start developing. Okay. Uh, okay, Bhante. <laughs> Hi, Bhante. Elizabeth here. Hello. How are you? <laughs> um, you know, I haven't been with you for uh, a long time. Um, I'm glad, so glad you came back from India. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I, I was going to come have visit you over there. <laughs> um, you know, you've always taught me and everyone that you don't fight with the hindrances, that they're your teachers, right. that they show you uh, where your attachments lie. And um, it seems uh, to me that it is impossible to be in a jhana if the hindrances are present. Right. Right. Um, I was really interested in that sutta. I thought that sutta was incredible, what you, what you read today. But thinking of the hindrances, so it might not be, and it might not be mine. It will not be, and it will not be mine. Right. What exists, what has come to be, that I am abandoning. Right. So it's, it's hard to articulate my question, but it, it kind of is suggesting probably something that seems so obvious to you and others on the call, but to me, it's kind of a revelation. It's like, um, I, I think I take them so personally. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it takes practice. And okay. that's, why, that's why the six R's are so important. Uh, one of the things that I want you to be careful of is trying to be perfect. Okay? Don't be perfect. Be human being. We all make mistakes. I can't say that. And you can't criticize yourself when you made a mistake. But learn from it. Don't do it again. Okay? Okay, and if the hindrance is a teacher, it's not my teacher, it's not mine. Well, it's your belief that it is yours, though. That hindrance is you. See, what happens, the way a hindrance arises is you broke one of the precepts. As soon as you break the precept, you take that on personally. This is me. This is mine. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that. And that's what the teacher is, is the realization that you took an impersonal process and you made it personal. Right. And when you forget to use the six R's on it and you get caught by some kind of emotional upset, that's when you really need to develop your laughing ability at how crazy your mind can be. Mm. You've taught and, me how to laugh in meditation. I never thought that I would ever do that, but I have done that <laughs> more and more. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. And and as soon as I laugh, it's like uh, it's like a a turbo six R or something. It's <laughs> like the process is sped up. It's it's really interesting. Yeah. To laugh. <laughs> well, that's how you be kind to yourself, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bhante, I have a question, if I may. Oh, okay. Hello. Hello. Um, this is a question about the base of nothingness. And I understand it 
from from today that it's a state of mind. Yes. And then here it says, it is possible that the evolving consciousness may pass on to rebirth in the base of nothingness. So that, it's a state of mind, but also something after death that... Well, let, let me explain it this way. To get to the state of mind of nothingness, you have to be purifying your mind quite a bit all along the way to get to that pure state. If you never go any higher than that, then when you die from this realm, you're going to go to the base of nothingness realm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what I do with my students is I, I, I'm tough. I, I push people along quite a bit so they can attain Nibbana. Okay, that, that's my goal for every student that I have. I want them to attain Nibbana. Mm -hmm. Whether it actually happens or not, it doesn't, but that's okay. I know that 99% oh, of my students that practice with me, they're going to experience a, a good rebirth unless they, <laughs> unless they don't take the teaching to heart. Right. And that just makes me happy. <laughs> so actually, the more you can Use the six R's that purify your mind. The more you, you have a perception of the world that's uplifting and happy. And you're not going to be caught so much in heaviness of mind. And that in itself makes me happy to see people doing that, to see you doing it. So the more you smile, the more uplifted you become, the easier it is to recognize all of these things as they occur. Okay? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. You're the one who are wanting to talk to you want me to talk to their group? Yes, we have a group that um, we've been communicating with David about having you come present the six hours to our group. A okay. little meditation group. <laughs> okay, when? Um, we, we will communicate with David and figure that okay. out with your schedule. Yes, thank you. I'm always open to teaching more about the six hours. I know Thank how you. good it is. For Thank my you. Practice. You're welcome. We just printed out your book. So we're really excited to. Oh. The Anapanasati <laughs> book. Oh, uh, that's the first book that I wrote that became popular. Yes. There's so many copies of that now. It's just, it's hard to keep up with them. <laughs> When, whenever I travel, I go into the monastery library and quite often I see copies of my book in the libraries in India, in Japan, in Korea. It's amazing. Yes, it's gone viral. <laughs> okay, it has. I was real happy when uh, Amazon had some uh, comments about the book and it gave me five stars. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Bhante, I have one more question, if I may. Okay. Um, you, you said today that you teach your students to uh, the, the object of meditation to be the quiet mind. Yes. Uh, could you speak a few words more about that? 
Well, the quiet mind is a mind that doesn't have any disturbance or movement of mind's attention at all. There is nothing, and that's what your object of meditation is. But as you start to be able to sit for longer periods of time, say, sit with a quiet mind for a half an hour, 45 minutes without your mind moving at all, mm -hmm. then you will be able to see the slightest little tiny movement of a thought starting to come up. And then you relax right then and stay with the quiet mind. And you'll be able to sit for a long time with a mind that's very quiet. Mm -hmm. And there's so much peace in that. And you make the most amount of merit because there is no unwholesome thing arising at all. No disturbance at all. And that's how you get to attain Nibbana, is by having that purified mind. And that... Yeah, you're you're not going to start doing the meditation and experiencing something like this. This is on down the road almost to the end. But it's real exciting for me to be with students that are that devoted that they're they're willing to spend long time sitting. I had a, one student, she was 80 years old when she started doing the meditation. And she could not sit still for more than 10 minutes at the start of the retreat. At the end of a 10-day retreat, her face had changed so much, all of the wrinkles had disappeared, she looked like she was 50 years old. She was she had trouble getting up and down stairs when she started, and she was running up and down stairs by the end of it. And she sat for two hours. She wow. was she was really determined to do it. And uh, geez, it's great to be around people like that. Thank you, Bante. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Bante, this is Elizabeth again. Okay. I noticed this statement in the sutta about once there is full confidence. Yeah. Um, could you say a few words about what that means, full confidence? Well, you know that you can point your mind in that direction and it's going to go there. You can experience it when you want it. Okay. That's full confidence. Okay. And it's actually, it's kind of fun to watch confidence grow in people as they start progressing in the meditation. Because they can start out very timid and unsure and having a lot of doubts. And then when they get up around the third jhana, their confidence is so strong that there's there's real personality change and they know that they they're on the right path and that's exciting thank you you're very welcome so any other questions okay then let's share some merit May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.
So have a good weekend. Have a good week. Keep smiling. And try practicing being in the job. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Bye, everyone. Thank you.